So uh, I got to jump into this morning's message here. I got a little fire and uh, thanks for sharing now the broadcast. You can share it to all the other platforms, guys. It'd be great. To, uh, welcome, welcome. Keeping your oil. Matthew 25. In fact, I'd love to just start there. And there is a lot of ground I want to cover today because the Lord's been speaking to me uh, specifically about the times we're moving into. So we're, we're going to start with our uh, message here. And, and really, it's a foundation out of Matthew 25. And then I want to move into some things that deal specifically on the extra oil supply, the extra oil supply. So how to stay full and burning, keep your lamps full and burning, the whole idea. But they took an extra supply of oil. And we need to know more than ever in these times of crisis or, or you know, shaking and uncertainty and crashing of economies. And, you know, uh, you know, here on Wall Street, anyways, things are happening. And uh, who knows, it may not be long, more and more, where we find ourselves thrust into times where we're going to have to uh, learn to get our oil, not just in traditional gatherings, events, conferences, the way that we did before, uh, but more than ever, the Lord is calling us to not just keep and be the priest of our lampstand, but the key to the, the part of the message I want to really share today and the whole teaching is how you can find and how you can keep, manage, and even grow in your extra overflow, overflow of oil. So many people teach about prayer or intimacy or praying in tongues or repentance. They give all the basic stuff about being full of the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they don't really spend a lot of time uh, in the deeper supernatural stuff asking the question, uh, how do we take an extra supply of oil and why? So uh, good to see you this morning. Dane jumped on. Uh, some of our staff are jumping on the broadcast. If we can be sure that we're sharing this broadcast with our uh, network of family and friends guys here today. Uh, I'm very excited about keeping your oil. So let's start with the parable of the wise and foolish virgin here in Matthew 25, how the kingdom of heaven is likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. I got my lamp. They took their lamps and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Five of them were wise virgins. Five were foolish. The ones who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. I want to kind of just highlight for a moment here that, you know, it's kind of obvious. You got the wise virgins. Well, they took oil. You got the foolish virgins. They didn't take any oil. But what's important here is, is, is I always heard it taught and kind of read uh, this parable in Matthew 25 uh, about, you know, the foolish virgins. And you don't want to be a foolish virgin. And you need to repent if you're prayerless. And you need to be sure you're full of the oil. But as I was reading this, the Lord really, uh, you know, kind of, you know, highlighted the fact that even the foolish virgins knew something think about the importance of having lamps that were full. Because if you if you read the story, their lamps were full just like the wise virgins. So they knew something about being sure they had oil in their lamp, keep it burning. They were the light on a hill. They needed to be sure that they were ablaze. The, the, the problem with the foolish virgins is not only did they not take extra oil, and that's what I'm talking about in this whole message today, is how do we find the overflow? I'm not focused so much on, are you full at the moment? The wise virgins were full, the, the foolish virgins were full too. But their sin was not taking an extra supply. Their sin was not knowing how to live in the overflow of the oil. And, and you can't help but think back to Psalms 23, where, where, you know, he says, he anoints my head with fresh oil. What happens when we receive the fresh oil? My cup runneth over. So overflow. What's the key to the overflow? The running over of the oil. And that's what we all want. The overflow is receiving the fresh oil. When you've been anointed with fresh oil, here's what happens. Your cup will overflow. Your lamp will be full and you'll have, like the wise virgins, you'll have an extra supply of oil. So one of the greatest keys right up front here, uh, I'm giving it away, to an extra supply of oil, and this is what the uh, foolish virgins should have learned in Matthew 25, is that they were full and they were sure they were full because they knew in the importance of being full of the Holy Spirit and fire. They knew the message about, you know, tending the lampstand and the priest of the lampstand every morning had to tend the lamp and every evening. It was like the biggest job is to be sure that the lamp doesn't go out in the tabernacle of God. And as we read, even in like Exodus 27 and in Exodus 34, it, there are some really specifics here about how to be the priest of your lampstand, keep it, keep it burning. 
I remember hearing one guy quote, uh, uh, you know, revival message. Listen, it's the Lord's responsibility to put the fire on the altar. You can only get the fire from heaven, but it's your job to keep it burning. And that was the whole, you know, role of, of kind of the priests is they had to tend the, the oil morning and evening because they had to be sure that their personal lamp of revival was burning. I'm responsible, you're responsible. And this is what the foolish virgins in the parable of Matthew 25 didn't understand is it's not just about being full in the moment. How did they get full? Where did they get that oil? And why is it the wise virgins, or I mean the foolish virgins, didn't understand that like the wise virgins in Matthew 25, they knew to have lamps burning, but they knew to take the extra supply of oil. And that's kind of, I mean, many Christians are burning, they're bright, they're blazing, but they didn't learn how to take extra oil. So when the oil runs dry, you can't just run to the next event or conference the way that you used to even a year ago and go, hey, I want some more. Can't run to your favorite teacher or prophet, maybe. Maybe you're like a lot of people, a little disappointed and a little disillusioned right now over the prophetic word and the prophetic voice. I didn't have a prophetic word. I didn't get involved in the prophetic politics. Not that I have an opinion either way. I'm Canadian, eh? But yeah, I'm praying for revival and great awakening in America. I'm, I'm holding the line in the sense that I stand on the word of God. I didn't say the word of any one man or the word of any one prophet. I stand on the word of God and I still know how the story goes. And more than ever now, uh, you know, in a time of fear and, and, and crisis, we're going to have to learn how do I get my own oil? How do I keep my oil? And so, of course, the obvious thing is, well, Todd, they got to pray and they got to pray every day and they got to have an intimacy and they got to repent. But I'm focused on they took and that was like the Holy Spirit said, I want you to have a whole message on not only keeping, but finding the key to being in the overflow. So when your lamp runs dry, because it will doing the works of Christ, get beat up in spiritual warfare, you get a little tired and a little, you know, who doesn't need a little refreshing. Uh, so when the extra oil runs by, remember the story uh, as we read on. Let me just finish it. Before I get uh, too ahead of myself here in Matthew 25, verse 3, that's where we're reading. Matthew 25, verse 3, the foolish took their lamps, but they did not take the extra oil with them. The wise took the oil in their vessels, extra oil, and with their lamps. But while the brood, bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. Let us not be a time for the church in 2021 because of how hard it was in, in 2020 and how hard it might be already. Don't let this be a time to slumber. Don't let this be a time to come down off the wall and, and slumber and sleep like Peter when Jesus said, can you not tarry one hour? Peter, the, the spirit is always willing. You know, you're willing to do the Holy Ghost and dreams and visions and missions. And yes, here I am, Lord, send me. But when the rubber hits the road day to day, week to week, if God was really to inspect your day-to-day -day radicalness outside of doing works or doing ministry, what would your day-to-day -day radical commitment in prayer look like? What would your day-to-day, -day, uh, that's the whole point of the story in Matthew 25. It's like when David uh, was out there as the shepherd, you know, and there was nobody there watching and David was amongst the sheep. He was the greatest priest before he was ever king. And I love the whole ministry and the understanding of the ministry of being made priests and kings. And that's our royal priesthood that you and I are are called, much like David, one of my favorite figures in the Bible now, David was called to be a priest onto the Lord. And that was kind of his first ministry. He did it with worship. He did it with the word. He did it when nobody was looking. And before he, you know, slayed the giant and, and was king of Israel, David was in his heart a true priest before the Lord in song, in word, in prayer. And uh, I love the heart of David. And so as we move on, we're talking about the heart of David here. I love uh, the fact that David was anointed king. And when you look at the anointing that David received, we, the nature of the anointing is, is an ever-increasing kind of growing anointing. Because David didn't just receive one. We know he received three anointings. Uh, David's three anointings over the course of 16 years, over 16 years, David's three anointings. And he was anointed first as a boy, called out amongst all of his brothers. It was the horn of oil. Samuel had the extra oil, and he took the horn of oil, and he poured it out on David. And he was anointed and had favor in the midst of all 
Paul's brothers. But then again, it was in 2 Samuel 2 uh, where David had a promotion, didn't he? His, his mantle grew, so to speak. His influence grew. And now David wasn't just king amongst, uh, you know, the discontent, broke, in debt, the mighty men that came to David in the caves in the wilderness. And, you know, the whole story that plays out before David was ever truly king, he was king in his heart and he had a people meeting with him in the caves of Adullam. So as the story goes on in the second Samuel 2, the second anointing of David comes. He's anointed as king over Judah. That's a little bit more rule, a little bit more promotion, a little bit more influence, a little bit more of a bigger ministry uh, as far as he's now recognized and received as the king of Judah. And then you read about the third amazing anointing that David received, and it's in second Samuel 5. This is the third anointing. And this is where David was recognized and received and promoted to king in the eyes of the people, uh, you know, of all of Israel, all of Israel. And then he had the decades of ruling and reigning in Zion. And that, you know, Zion, you know, speaks prophetically of the fullness of your destiny. And, and maybe it might take you uh, five years. Maybe it might take you three and a half. Maybe it might take you 16. But when you get to the fullness of what they call ruling and reigning in Zion, the prophetic picture of ruling in Zion is you're walking in the fullness of your third anointing. Some call that a kingly anointing, a kingship anointing. And I, I do do a series of messages on the kingly anointing. But uh, today, the anointing and the nature of the anointing grows as it did in the life of David when we're faithful and, and we're faithful in the little and, and he received. So we understand the principles of growing in the anointing. And uh, and so today, talking about the extra oil, using the, the, the story in Matthew 25, the foolish virgin, the wise virgin, I, I looked at it different than I had all the times before. And I was like, well, Lord, the wise virgins had the, the lamps burning, but so did the foolish virgins. So before you rebuke them, they also knew something about having full and they were able to get their lamps full. At one point, you know, the, the, the foolish virgins in the story did get their lamps full, but their sin was they did not take extra oil in their vessels. And so I was referencing earlier in Psalms 23, the great, the Lord anoints my head with fresh oil. So one of the keys to having not just your lamp full and full of the Holy Spirit, but the overflow is to be touched by the fresh oil. Why would David call it fresh oil if there wasn't fresh oil? Yesterday's oil isn't what you need for today's anointing. And, and there's always fresh oil. Every day there's fresh anointing. Every day there's fresh oil. The fresh oil is an automatic. When you're touched continuously with the fresh oil, your cup will overflow. So uh, I'm excited about the overflow here this morning, guys, and uh, talking specifically your lamps. And I want to kind of come back to the lamp because we know we're talking about the lampstand and we, you know, can't help but maybe picture the, the seven lamps and the golden pipes and the bowls and the, the whole uh, seven lamps of the menorah, which uh, right there, the lampstand here speaks of the seven spirits of God, right? It had seven bowls, seven golden reciprocals that could receive the oil. We're going to come to that in a moment, Zechariah 4, and we're going to tie it into the great witness in Revelation 11, and, and that's kind of where I believe we are and where we're going. So you're waiting for the prophetic part of the message today. Uh, you know, I'm going to get there and, and why I believe this is one of the most important messages on keeping your oil right now. And uh, I've learned a lot about how to stay full, but I've learned a lot about walking in the momentum or walking in the legacy or walking in the overflow. So before we get too hard on the foolish virgins, we need to remember they knew the importance of being sure that the lamps were full like the wise virgins. They started out with the same Holy Ghost, faith, power, full, on fire, revival, Christians, whatever you want to call them, Holy Ghost, Spirit, fit, whatever. But along the journey of serving the Lord and teaching and preaching and ministry and going about the works of the kingdom, uh, the, the wise virgins, uh, you know, had the extra oil. So when they got empty, they could refresh themselves. When they got tired and burned out, they could refresh themselves. When they needed healing and restoration, they knew about rest and refreshing. But the foolish virgins, they knew the importance of the oil because when they realized their lamps were going out, that means they were neglecting the very first command for the priest of the lampstand. To be sure, morning and night, you tend the oil. You're the one that's responsible uh, for your personal lampstand. I'm not talking about church, ministry, prayer meetings, public, anything. I'm talking about when nobody's looking like David and you're in the field, does it count? Are you really a priest? 
Or you're just a priest for the, the faces of the people, for the money, for the partners, for the whatever. And uh, you need this. So we're coming into an hour where the goat nations are going to be separated. The sheep nation are going to be separated. The foolish virgins are going to be exposed. And they were foolish because when their lamps were going out, they went to the wise because they knew the importance of the oil here. Just like most believers, they know the importance of the Holy Spirit and fire and prayer and intimacy and all the Christian basics and foundational truths. But they didn't know how to get their own oil because when they went to the, the, the wise virgins, they said, give us some of yours. Give us some of your oil. You remember the story. Well, why do you want my oil? Why do you know that you need my oil? My lamps, uh, our lamps are going out. We're tired. We're weary. We're a little beat up. We had the oil, but we don't know how to get more. And the Bible goes on in the story. The foolish said to the wise in verse 8, Matthew 25, verse 8, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should not be enough oil for us. You can run out of oil. You can run out of oil. Some people are operating without the anointing. And lest there not be enough for us, but rather go yourself. Now this is the call to go yourself to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, because they needed to go to the source of the oil, we know the source of the oil. And we know we have to ourselves have that alone intimacy. Nobody can do it for us. Not your pastor, not Todd Bentley online, not any of your favorite prophets online. In fact, you should all take a social media break. I haven't been on here other than me from preaching. I'm tired of all the fighting and all the division and all the stuff that seems to not be kingdom right now. When we ought to be worried about the greatest harvest, when we uh, the opportunities that are before us in a global pandemic, globally, the fear that's amongst the people here in America, the fear that we're socialists, that we're being censored, that we're being shut down, that we're going to the left. The fear is around the world right now. Is, is, is there so much uncertainty uh, in the day? Listen, it's more than important than ever that you are a wise virgin and that people know that you're burning and people know that you have an extra supply of oil, but more and more, the, the foolish virgins are, are being shown up in this hour as maybe what worked in the 90s or the early 2000s and you're able to run the conference to conference, meeting to meeting and get all the prayer lines and bam, 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 and people pray. I still do that. I believe in impartation. I'm not taking away from the importance of impartation, but if you don't realize that you're living in a day where you need to gather not just enough oil to keep it in your lamps, keep it burning, but the extra supply of oil. You need to know how to be touched with fresh oil because when you're anointed with fresh oil, there's an automatic. Your cup will runneth over. The key to running over and the overflow is in the fresh oil. So you ought to learn everything you can about the fresh oil. Why is it called the fresh oil? Why did David say he anoints my head with fresh oil? Again, in Psalms 92, it talks about being anointed with the horn of the fresh oil. God was even going to exalt my horn, my life, my strength, my vision, my purpose like a wild ox. God's anointing me with fresh oil. And we can see the benefits of the anointing oil in Psalms 92 verse 10 right through the rest of that Psalms 92. If you start reading in Psalms 92 verse 10, you'll see what the fresh oil will do for you. But we're living in a day now, and I love it in the New Covenant and the New Testament. People have almost done away with the idea of well, needing to do anything, you know, even prayer. When we understand in Matthew eleven six, 6, it's been a, a foundation for me to more. More God, more fire, more revival, more anointing. And Matthew eleven six is a believer. I'm a believer to this day still in pressing in, seeking the Lord, the passionate pursuit of his presence. But uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there's something about diligently. God, you are my God. Psalm 63, God, you are my God. Early, diligently will I seek you. David had a commitment. Even in the wilderness, in the desert, running from Saul, hiding on the caves of Adullam. You can read the whole passion of David. This wasn't like David as king in the palace at the table, surrounded by all the royal you know, people and courts and money and favor. No, David was running and hiding out in the wilderness, in the caves. and He just had a, a few hundred mighty warriors that came that were all broken and, and outcasts in society anyways. But David, under the first anointing, before it grew into the second anointing, the third anointing, uh, you know, David was a, a faithful priest. He was king and priest, but he knew that the key to being king was priest. And it really is true to this day. You're not just called to be a priest, the ministry of the worship of the Lord. You're also called to be a king and kings reign in this life. 
we reign in this life as kings. But part of ruling and reigning in this life as kings is understanding that the greatest ministry of the kingship is the priestly ministry. The priestly ministry. That'll make you the prophetic voice. If you want to talk about prophet, priest, and king, you can function as a prophetic person, open your mouth, make a decree, and speak things that set the course of your own life and purpose and direction. Start prophesying over your own life. Make a decree. Don't look for the prophets to give you a prophet word. Listen, I've been in one of the darkest, hardest, challenging places of my life the last 18 months, and, and still in a time of transition here, uh, coming out of a time of healing and restoration, still, you know, just clinging on to the Lord and, 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 and just wanting to move forward and challenging days and times where everything is uh, changing for churches and buildings and how we meet, how we gather. And so uh, having to make all those adjustments, I've grown tired and weary, tired of all the stuff that was false and fake and true. Maybe that was old. I just tired of all the baloney and all the, the stuff that was put all over social media and splashed all. I was like, God, I'm going to do a business. I <laughs> start a, a, a secular business and I'm going to do Magnificent Bag Company and I'm going to do this business with my wife. And we have been. It's been amazing. Uh, but I've been feeling the pull and the tug, you know, to prepare for something coming this year. And, uh, you know, that's why I will have a few limited events and speaking sessions later this spring and summer 2021, almost after two full years since RHALA in August. But uh, I'll tell you, the message has been uh, about the oil and, and, and the importance of functioning as a prophet, priest, and king, but the prophet of my own life, not getting a prophetic word. I can't think in two years of one person I went to and said, do you have a word for me? You have a word for me. Not that that in itself is wrong, but we've grown a culture, especially in America, of people that have been so conditioned that look where we are now because of the division between who prophesied, Trump this, Trump that, the elections, we mixed our prophetic word in the politics, and now we're in the greatest divide. It's all over Facebook. Ah! Really? We're still the kingdom. The increase of his government will still be no end. The king on the throne is the king of kings, lord of lords. It's Jesus. We have an unshakable kingdom. Don't be surprised what's happening in the media and the left and the fake news and the government and the big tech and the censorship. Deep darkness shall cover the earth. But arise and shine for your light has come. We're called to be a peculiar, set apart, peculiar, different, distinct people. How will they know, Lord? The nations, Israel said. How will they know, Lord? Moses cried with Israel. How will they know, Lord, that you're with us? He said, I'm going to make you a distinct, peculiar, separate people. And people knew that God was with Israel by the glory by, of a day and by the fire by night. Those signs are coming again. We're living in a day where God's going to separate the false. We're in the true valley of decision. We need to decide right now whose side we're on. Are we going to be radical and on fire and serve Jesus? Or are we going to continue to be worldly Christians in, in Babylon and, and uh, you know, think we can live on impartation or somebody else's prayers or attending churches or whatever? our good merits might be. We are being called back to do what I told you to do in the beginning. We're being called back to that place where we can be the true priests of our lampstand. God is the one, and you've got to ask him, God, bring the fire to the altar. He puts it on the, uh, you know, there's no fire on the altar without God, but you and me are called to keep the fire burning. That's what keeping your oil is all about here uh, today. And so, you know, the lampstand, I was talking a little bit about the lampstand, and we see and we think about the lampstand, the seven, you know, lamps, uh, it represents the seven spirits of God. Where was Jesus standing in, in uh, Revelation uh, 120? He was standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. So we know prophetically, let me lay a foundation for a moment here, that the lampstands speak of the seven churches, not seven just churches, but seven being the complete full church. And so God's message to the lampstands, which prophetically, here's the wise virgins with their lamps, keep them burning and they didn't take any extra oil and and uh and, and then you have the the foolish virgin so the lampstand uh prophetically represents of course the, the the greater church it represents the the menorah uh the seven spirits of god you have the oil dripping in to the golden you know reciprocals and you have the the fire burning and you tend the lamp morning and night as the priests were commanded in exodus thirty one twenty and exodus 27 uh you know those are some of my favorite scriptures now let me just have you turn for a moment in your bible to Zechariah 4. Come on, people of God. Turn, if you have your Bible, real quick, to Zechariah chapter 4. So, yeah, we do see how to get extra oil, uh, you know, in the story of the foolish virgins, practically in that they were called to go to the ones themselves that sell. They were saying, go to the source. 
So yeah, it's, it's the high call to the secret place of his presence, but it's that alone time when nobody's looking. So much of Christianity today, and I've met many of the fake you know, preachers that have built a business out of preaching and ministry. They barely are in the word of God week to week. I, there was a time in my life 10 years ago I was in that word and I know it. And They don't pray the way that they used to. They're called coasting Christians or coasting ministers or coasting preachers. And they're not bringing the, the manna. They're not bringing the fresh oil. They're not operating in the overflow. They're operating out of what they learned in the 80s or 90s. You see it still on Christian TV. It's like when we get these things that worked 10 years ago or five years ago or 25, 30, 40 years ago, we want to continue to use those methods or continue to use those traditions. And we got a too much old school thinking in how we go about thinking we're going to get the extra oil. And I am going to give you some practical tips here, guys. Uh, in fact, let me just do this before we jump too much into Zechariah, but uh, I got to get to it in my Bible, get to it in yours. Zechariah 4, and before you just know it all, especially you preachers, let me present a couple of different ideas here about the sons of fresh oil. I just love that term. I used to preach many years ago a lot of kind of messages on the sons of fresh oil, and I don't hear really a lot of people talking about the sons of fresh oil. How to be a son, how to be a daughter of fresh oil. I love the fresh oil. There is fresh oil. Remember this term in the scripture, you know, in battle? Remember King Saul? Uh, you know, he had to anoint the shield. What was that in Israel when they would anoint the shield? When they would anoint the shield, it was like, I, I'm not going to get a new shield. I don't need just a new gift. I'm just going to take the shield that I've been using. I have my gift, my calling, my purpose. And rather than just trying to get a new gift all the time, chasing after new mantles all the time, uh, whatever, I'm going to ask the Lord to anoint my shield. Because it, they say that a shield that, that's had the wine and the oil and, you know, there's a process of applying the wine and the oil continuously to the shield in battle. And uh, it's stronger than just kind of breaking in a new shield. So they would anoint the shield they already had, the gift, the calling, the purpose, and they would get fresh oil on it. That's a prophetic picture. Just like the shepherds that were responsible for the sheep, you know, there's a prophetic picture I love about the oil and how it protects you, the anointing, how it protects you, is that the sheep, if he was a good shepherd, because, you know, uh, when you're out there in the fields, those white, poopy, stinky, fluffy sheep. I've seen them in the hills of Wales, Scotland. You know, my wife, she was like, the sheep. She made us get out of the car when we were preaching in Wales and go over and see all the sheep. But the sheep kind of stink, but they got a lot of insects around them, a lot of flies, a lot of tormenting insects. I don't know about you as Christians, but that's a prophetic picture of demonic torment. And, uh, you know, one thing that the good shepherd does is he takes the sheep and he dips the entire sheep. They call it a sheep dip. And he dips the entire sheep into the oil, not just part of it, not just a little dab of oil will do you. Here's a little holy anointing oil. No, you would dip the whole sheep in the oil and you'd call it a sheep dip. Why? Because uh, the, the oil would be saturated. The sheep would be dripping in oil, protecting the sheep from all the, the insects that want to torment. And so it's time for us to pray, Lord, I need a Holy Ghost ship deep. I need you to take me and dip me in the, the Holy Ghost oil. I want to drip with the fresh anointing. What happens when you get the fresh anointing? He anoints my head with fresh oil. It's an automatic overflow. So if you're ready to live in the overflow, there is no my cup run up over. There is no extra supply of oil besides what's burning in your lamp if you don't know how to get and find and maintain uh, the fresh oil, which we know can only be found uh, in intimacy with Jesus. Yes, you can get it through the laying on of hands. Yes, you can get it through impartation. Uh, the foolish virgins went to the wise virgins and said, hey, our lamps are about to go out. Pray for us to have some of your oil. But here's what the wise virgins knew. No. We can't take the extra oil we have in our vessels and give it to you because then we won't have enough. We're coming to a day where we're going to have to live in the ever-increasing constant flow. I, I've been talking to my daughter about the Holy Spirit. She just got baptized in the Holy Spirit at five, speaking in tongues. I've been mentoring her for six months every single day in the prayer room. She's memorized over 25 scriptures. She's having visions, writing down her dreams. She's only five years old. We spend at least 30 minutes soaking, waiting on the Lord. She says, Dad, are we going to have a vision? Are we going to see the same thing in the spirit realm at the same time like we did two other times? Dad, imagine this. I've gone into the spirit and me and my five-year-old daughter, and this is like a Bob Jones thing. Me and my five-year-old daughter have seen the same vision at the same time and we both wrote it down and she was so blown away that the Lord was able to open her eyes to show us the same vision at the same time. I love that deep supernatural stuff. So it's like personal revival in the Bentley family here in my house and, and I've been loving it every day and I've been teaching my daughter about the Holy Spirit, not just being like a, a, a little dab of oil, uh, but that the Holy Spirit is called rivers of God like white water rapids. 
I don't know about your Holy Spirit. It's not just a little oil, but my Holy Spirit is rivers of oil. The rock, rivers of oil. I'll pour out my spirit like water on him who is thirsty, like floods, floods on dry ground. Now, that's a lot of Holy Spirit. I'll turn your desert and your wilderness into pools. I'll turn your wilderness into an oasis. Streams and rivers in the desert. Why is it God's got rivers running through the dry places? God's got rivers running. He's got pools. He's got an oasis. He's got an outpouring for you. That's not like water, but the outpouring is floods. I mean, who would like to receive the floods of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I mean, you don't even have enough room in your lamp to receive the floods. That's going to give you overflow. So part of how you perceive the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus have the Holy Spirit? It says Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. Jesus didn't have any measure. He had the Spirit without measure. The fact that Jesus had the Spirit without measure suggests to me, and I've experienced this to be true in Scripture too, is that the Holy Spirit without measure is possible. It's called the fullness of God. Of his fullness we have received. The fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, Jesus, the head of the church, and of his fullness, even of his grace, we have all received. So we need to learn how to receive and tap into the greater vine. We're the branches, but being tapped into the greater vine, into the greater source, into the greater, we're a tree planted by the rivers. Hallelujah. And you need to understand that when Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he said, Holy Spirit would be rivers of living water flowing from your belly. Rivers of living water. So I've been teaching my daughter, that's how you need to see the anointing. When you're laying hands on people and you're praying for healing, in Jesus' name, you need to see rivers. And those rivers that go all the way back to the source, to the throne of God in Revelation 22, don't they? And it's a river of life. It's a river of healing. It's a river of harvest, as you see the river of God in Ezekiel 47. And so that's how I teach on the anointing. And I think that's an important truth there, guys. Uh, I said we were going to get to Zechariah 4, and I'm trying to get there real quick. And, and, and in my Bible, I just keep getting Holy Ghost carried away. Pray in the Spirit for a moment. Get stirred up, guys. Uh, the minor prophets here. Uh, remember, uh, if you're just joining the broadcast, RevivalHarvestMinistries.org is live. There's a new update letter from me and Jessel. Uh, what's up for 2021? Uh, share a little bit of my journey, the last 18 months of healing and restoration and rest and recovery. Uh, but we're getting ready for some stuff in 2021. So we've been talking earlier about RHA Charlotte, North Carolina coming up, how you can sign up, be a part of our teams, evangelism, worship, prayer, uh, the outreach. If you heard about RHA Ole in New York, RHA uh, Los Angeles, uh, here we are the first here of 2021. It's all about the streets, souls, reaching people with the gospel, March 18th to the 21st. Go to our website, RevivalHarvestMinistries.org. Click on the RHA graphic and figure out how you can volunteer and be plugged into what's about to take place in just a few short weeks uh, in our first massive evangelism event in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you've ever been to a conference, Fresh Fire, if you've ever been to Secret Place Church, if you've ever been to Morning Star Ministries, it's going to be an entire new ground that we're going to start to pioneer, uh, you know, and who knows where it's going to take us, but we're doing a whole new work in, in the Carolinas, but it's uh, North Carolina. Of course, many of us knew us in Fort Mill, South Carolina, uh, but we've moved in our Revival Harvest Ministry base is going to be towards the North Carolina, uh, but we're doing the RHA event like all of our other harvest events. And so if you want to be a part of this one, uh, I'm praying and believing God and calling for 500 evangelists uh, that'll come and join us. So all the details and how to volunteer are posted on RevivalHarvestMinistries.org. It's also where you can have your updated partner information. You can give any time that you want to as led by the Lord. You want to sow into the oil. You want to sow into RHA and souls and sow a new seed. Honor the Lord with the first fruit seed here. Uh, you can tell there's a fresh anointing and something fresh happening in our ministry. You want to sow into it. Yeah, impartation, sowing, giving. That's another way to partner in with the oil. But, uh, you know, remember we have updated Fresh Fire Ministries to Revival harvestministries.org and our website is a one-stop shop for information so check it weekly in addition to sign up for our free weekly podcast on itunes supernatural living messages let's get back to our teaching here today on how to operate in the overflow keeping your oil and taking an extra supply so zechariah chapter 4 reading in verse 11 zechariah chapter 4 verse 11 the prophets had a dream. The prophets had a vision. 
and he's talking to the angel, uh, continuing in his vision that starts in Zechariah 4.1. We're picking it up in Zechariah 4.11. So the prophet Zechariah is engaged in this trance-type vision, in this conversation with an angel of awakening in Zechariah 4.1. The angel that came to awaken him. So it's an awakening angel in Zechariah 4.1. The angel that woke him up. And so we read on in Zechariah 4 verse 11. Uh, I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at the left of the lampstand? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the reciprocal of the two golden pipes? Are you the branch and he's the vine? John 15. The branches bear the fruit. Fruit happens. It's not something we work for. Fruit happens. How does fruit happen? Abiding in the vine. We are the branches. In this is your father glorified that you bear much fruit. Fruit that remains. He wants you to be fruitful. He gives us the key to fruitfulness and he calls it uh, the anointing, intimacy, and fruitfulness. That's what John 15 paraphrased all about. The anointing, intimacy, fruitfulness. You have the anointing because of intimacy. Anointing and intimacy produces fruitfulness, much fruit. The Father is only glorified in more souls getting saved, more churches being planted, more demons being cast out. Uh, the Father is only glorified that you bear fruit, but much fruit. And fruit happens as long as you're focused on I'm the vine and the vine does nothing, but you know is sure that he guards the secret place of his presence and he's sure that he's plugged into the source. He's plugged into the vine. And and here we have the branches dripping the oil. Could that be you and me, ministries? You and me are the branch that drips the oil. The oil is dripping into seven pipes. The oil pipes have a, a reciprocal, seven reciprocals that receive the oil that's dripping from the two olive branches. And, and we know in this story, the source of the oil is the olive branches. I want to come to this for a minute. The source of the oil is, is there, you know, standing uh, olive branches, olive trees, if you would. On either side of the lampstand. Remember Matthew 25, it was all about the lampstand. Remember Revelation 120, Jesus in the midst of the seven lampstands. So he's speaking to the church in this hour, in these dark days, about the sons of fresh oil. That's the ministry I'm talking about today in Revelations 4.11. Then he answered and he said to me, in Revelation 4.13, he answered and he said to me, You do not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, these are the two sons of fresh oil. These are the two anointed ones. I love this in Zechariah 4, 14. The two anointed ones, the two sons of fresh oil that stand besides the Lord of the whole earth. So there's the key in this whole Zechariah thing is they're standing next to the Lord. They're standing next to the Lord. But I want to give you something right out of the Hebrew language about the sons of fresh oil. I want you to see something here about the sons of fresh oil. So I just got my notes here. Uh, literally notes on, on, on the sons of fresh oil. Christ's offices of king and priest. That's what we're seeing here. Joshua and, and Zerubbabel. Two actual ministries. One was a priestly ministry. One was like a, a governing ministry kind of political governing type ministry. One was Zerubbabel, kind of the governor, and he's getting the prophetic word from the prophet Zechariah. And then we have Joshua, the high priest. And what we see here is both a priestly and kingly office, especially in Zechariah 4.14. is the sons of fresh oil, the two anointed ones, are a kingly ministry and a priestly ministry. We talked a lot about David. We talked a lot about how you and me are called to be a kingdom of what? Priests and kings, a royal priesthood. We're a peculiar, we're a set apart, very distinct people by the glory of God. And, uh, you know, Christ's office of king and priest were shared shadowed forth by them from the union of these two offices in his person, both God and man. The fullness of grace is received and imparted. They built the temple. They built the church of God. So does Christ spiritually build you and me. Christ is not only the Messiah, the anointed one himself, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, the anointed one, holy and anointed one. We're talking about the source, the olive branch, the, or the olive tree itself, the vine itself, Jesus Christ, the anointed one. It's not any anointed man, woman, new mantle, old mantle. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the ministry that Jesus brings, and we function as priests, worship the word, and out of that we become prophets, and we speak uh, words of life and decree, and, and we function as kings. We 
have dominion, we rule, we reign, uh, you know, but it's all about standing next to the Lord of the earth and, and learning how to receive the fresh oil as described here in Zechariah 4, 11 through 14. Just a few verses before this, we're talking about grace, grace, shouts of grace, grace, bringing forth the capstone, the finished work from the foundation of the temple that was laid to not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, Zechariah 4, 6. It's not military might, strength, 401k, money, stock market. Those are great things to have and use for the kingdom, but we can't depend upon them that they're even going to be there in the days to come with what's coming and how dark it's going to be. But we are moving into the days where the suns of fresh oil are ready to arise and shine for your light has come. The key is not only on keeping your oil and being sure that the lamps are full like the wise virgins, even the foolish virgins in Matthew 25, they were sure that their lamps were full, but their sin was they did know the overflow. They didn't take an extra vessel of oil. Not only can you be full of the Holy Ghost, faith and power and burning, but you can take an extra vessel of oil like the wise virgins did. They knew that they needed to be full and they needed to be full of the Holy Ghost, burning everything that a lampstand is, the priest of the lampstand is, but they, the key is the overflow. I took extra oil. The foolish virgin didn't take extra oil. They had to go to the wise virgins to say, give us the oil you have. No! Unless we don't have enough oil for ourselves. We're moving into a day, people. Maybe we can't get to the events or the gatherings or the conferences the way that we used to. And should it get more difficult, we're going to have to go to the source more and more to not only get the oil, maintain the oil, but to be sure that the key here is when your lamps aren't burning and you're out there in the fields and you're bringing in the harvest and you're weary and you're in the spiritual warfare and the battle and whatever it might be, is when you realize your lamp's not burning as hot as it used to burn, do you know how to tap into the momentum, into the legacy, into the overflow of the oil that you have? How about building the extra oil, multiplying the oil, the overflow of the anointing? So we see here in Zechariah 4.14, as I've been teaching, uh, we see the sons of fresh oil. And I want to kind of give you this idea. The angel, having expressed his astonishment at the prophet's ignorance, because the prophet Zechariah did not know what he was seeing. He said, I see two bushes of the olive tree. The olive tree stood there. There were two, B'nai Yitshar. I don't know if I'm saying it right. B'nai Nitshar, sons of fresh oil in the Hebrew, B'nai Nitshar. It literally means to be endued or supplied with extra oil. Did you see it? Right there in Zechariah 4.14 in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for sons of oil, B'nai Yitshar, literally means... Not only is your lamp full, but you're endued with extra supplied oil. Endued with extra supplied oil. If you're enjoying anything about this message, want to hear it again, or think anybody would be blessed by this message, would you hit the share tab now? At, during this broadcast, people can go back and listen to it later and the views go up. It's going to be on my Supernatural Living Messages weekly podcast on iTunes. We have a message every week on iTunes. But uh, listen, you know, this is our online Secret Place Church gathering. So go ahead and share the broadcast. Maybe you're just tuning in for the first time. Please comment. Please do say hi and uh, let me know where you're coming in from. We should have a couple of administrators in the chat. Joshua Patat, my outreach director, Dane Noble, uh, a couple of our staff are in the chat. But uh, I'm talking about the Hebrew word for sons of oil in Zechariah 4 verse 14, the B'nai Yetshar, sons of oil, endued or supplied with oil. Now watch this. I love this same word, uh, the Hebrew word, the root word uh, in Zechariah 4 14. You find it again in Isaiah 5 1, in Isaiah 5 1, which is a reference to the Lord building his vineyard on the highest anointed fertile hill. That, that's a term for the sons of fresh oil, uh, where the Lord establishes his work. The Lord establishes his vineyard, his garden, his work, his purposes by grace in your life by putting you on the highest fertile, most anointed hill. The Hebrew word there for sons of fresh oil found again in Isaiah 5 verse 1. Search it out. It's pretty amazing. But we have to be endued with oil. We have to be supplied 
with the extra oil. And we know that this is the Holy Spirit. So coming back to the golden lampstands, the imagery here in Matthew 25, the wise virgins, the foolish virgins, the imagery here again in Zechariah 4. We see it again in Revelation 11. I might get there if I have time. We see the imagery again of the lampstands prophetically uh, throughout the scripture, the golden candlesticks or the lampstands. And like in Revelation 1.13, Revelation 2.1, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches in Revelation 1.20. The apostle, he founded the church. And we're also called the light of the world. Men light a candle, they put it on a candlestick and it gives light to them that are on the house. Matthew 5, 14 and 15. We don't put the candlestick so that nobody can see the candle. Uh, you know, we're gonna be living in days where we're gonna have to choose our side, even on social media. And you're gonna have to choose to be a light, no compromise. And when nations are goat nations and maybe not sheep nations, maybe the city or the region you live in is going to line up more with the goat type nation than, than, than the, the sheep nation. Or, or it's not going to be a city of refuge, uh, whatever state or city you're in. And we're starting to see division in our nation here already. And who knows where that division is going to go. They're talking about introducing new states. And I'm hearing about a country or places like Texas. We're going to succeed from the U. I mean, we are in a place. People are talking civil war, all kinds of craziness. Maybe World War III, what's going to happen in the global reset, all the banks around the world. I'm not here to give my opinion one way or another, people, and I have one. But I do know we hold the line based on what it says in the scripture, and we already know the end. And whether it's now or 20 years or 50 years, we're definitely closer to the last of the last of the last of the last days now. And more than ever, the message is we need to be sure that we have an oil and that we have an extra supply of oil because we may be living in days where you can't get away for a whole week and pray the way that you like to and soak the way that you like to and get along with God the way because you're thrust into the busyness of revival on the streets, uh, uh, seeing tens of thousands saved. In the midst of that, your lamp might not be burning the way that it used to, but if you know how to live in the overflow and you know how to have the extra oil with you, you won't be like the foolish virgins who had lamps that were full so they knew something about prayer and the oil and being right with God or they wouldn't have had full lamps. They wouldn't have prepared that much. But their failure was they, they when the oil ran out and they weren't refreshing themselves and they were in the meeting and they were teaching and preaching and doing all these nights of revival. When it came to the end, they didn't know how to refresh themselves and get filled up again. This is why I believe Jesus, even after the disciples, they're, oh, the demons, we cast out demons, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, rape the dead, cast out demons. And they do all these works for the Lord in revival. And it says the Lord called them away to be alone for a while. The Lord called them to himself to be alone with him for a while. So I believe there's still calls like that, especially in these dark days. Uh, it's going to be key more than ever that we're hearing the prophetic word, not because we're reading QAnon conspiracies and prophesying them, mixing them into our prophetic word with our policies or prophetic stuff. And I'm a Trump fan. I do believe all the prophetic words about the purpose of Trump. I didn't give or follow any of the prophetic stuff about the recent elections, but I do believe that God has used and will continue to use Trump as a trumpet. Uh, you know, regardless of my opinion politically, I'm a Canadian. I don't vote anyways, so don't get all offended. But we are living in the days where the Lord is calling us back to we already have the script. We know how it's going to play out. And I've been amazed at how unchristian Christians have been and how much Christians have been panicking and freaking out since the pandemic of 2020. It's like they don't remember their Bibles. They don't remember that we're called in the end to be priests and kings and to bring the government of God into this world. And it doesn't matter what's happening in the world around us. Whether all this led to, I'm not saying it will, but whether it all actually did to a global reset and a crash of the economy and what ends up coming out of that is a one world government and a one economy and people are going to have their antichrist kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I'm just saying right now, why should that concern the Christian? Why should the Christians be in such panic over what just took place in America's elections when we know the end, when we know who we are? And so I've been talking about this. Let me, let me just say uh, a couple of things about the oil. We love the sons of oil, the people possessed of oil. And that's what the sons of fresh oil are. Sons and daughters possessed of the oil of the Holy Spirit, they're oil bearers. 
They're, they're channels through which the, the Holy Spirit can move. You and me are the branches. The branches are dripping into the bowls. We're the ministry of Christ, the anointed one. Christ, uh, the Christ ministry, Christ in you, Christ in me, Jesus through you, Jesus through me, the oil dripping from the branches in Zechariah 4. So um, coming back, and I do have a few minutes here, and we're going to end in Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Just go there with me again. And, and it's important to understand using Scripture in context to interpret Scripture. Scripture in context to interpret Scripture. So you can't go through the whole Sons of Fresh Oil, Zechariah 4, without tying it into Revelation 11. Now look at Revelation 11. <clears throat> I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, you're going to measure three things. It's important that you catch this in Revelation 11. 1. The angel of God has a divine measuring rod to measure three things. This is what God is measuring. He's measuring what? The altar, the temple of God, and those who worship. What does God measure in our life when the angel comes in Revelation 11? 1? The altar, prayer, the incense, how fiery... Are the prayer bowls of Revelation 8 full of the incense? Are the bowls full over a city, over a region, over a church, over a nation, over a ministry? He's measuring. Why? Because when the measurement hits the right, then the bowls tip over. Answered prayer. So he's measuring the worship or the temple in Revelation 11. 1. Why is he measuring the temple? That's the church. The life of the church, the community of the church, how the church functions as the true body of Christ from head to toe, feet, the fullness of God manifest in bodily form through the church. We don't see a whole lot of that because we're so built upon building one man or one woman or one mega ministry. We're not focused on the church is the, not only the head, but the church is the fullness of him, the fullness of God expressed manifest you'll never have the fullness of god manifest unless it manifests through the body and if the whole body's not learning to work together the church won't have the fullness of god forget about any one ministry or one believer being super anointed and being the fullness of god i'm talking about the lampstand and and using the language of the lampstand it's always the greater church and it's not one individual okay just like the matthew 25 parable the wise virgins the fools virgins that's you and me where do we find ourselves in the story so being consistent with scripture to interpret scripture we come to revelation 11 and the third thing that god is measuring is the worship now why is god measuring the worship of the temple he's measuring the worship of the temple in revelation 11 verse 1 because he wants to know the passion are you really worshiping in spirit and truth or is it with religious form and tradition and you go through the motions but no god is wanting to know when that worship when the church of god you know becomes uh in ephesians 4 the full manifestation of the of the of the fullness of God Jesus in all of its ministry through all of the body apostles pastors prophets teachers all the but a great fullness of God will be displayed to the nations through the church not through one man or woman or you or me uh, but we got to be plugged into the body Jesus is the head so uh, again we see in Revelations 11 what happens when he hits the fullness ready Revelation 11 verse 6 or I'm sorry Revelation 11 verse um Three, I will now give power to my two witnesses. Sounds like Zechariah 4, 14. I will give power to my two witnesses. And what do you do with this power? Power to what? Prophesy, power prophecy. It's not just prophetic words and encouragement, prophecy, uh, future telling. It's literally power. And the power is to prophesy. I call this power uh, prophecy, power prophecy. It's creative. And uh, you're going to prophesy. And then it says, who are these two witnesses? Again, in Revelation eleven four, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Same verse in Zechariah 4, 14. You know Zechariah 4 has to fit into Revelation 11. You cannot interpret anything in Revelation, Revelation 11 without Zechariah 4, verse 14, without the sons of fresh oil that are endued with oil, supplied with oil. It's all about the oil, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And here's the Holy Spirit as the source, and he's giving them power. And what are these two witnesses going to do? They're going to prophesy. But as it goes on into 
to verse 5. I love it in verse 5 and 6, Revelation 11. If anyone wants to harm them, the two witnesses, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Sounds like Elijah calling down fire on the, the false prophets. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. They have power to what? Shut up heaven so that no rain falls. Sounds like Elijah again in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters to strike them to blood, strike them to the earth, plagues as often as they desire. How about that there in Revelation 11, verse 6, moving in the power of God as often as they desire. What a place of partnership with the Holy Spirit as a co-laborer, as an ambassador, that we have this ability to prophesy and, and do signs, wonders, and miracles in Revelation 11, 6, as often as they desire. And clearly, these are the two witnesses and, and again, understanding the two witnesses in Zechariah 4 verse 14 were, were two people, but they actually represent a greater fullness, just like the whole message of the lamps, the lampstand, Revelation 1 20. It's not seven churches, literally seven lampstands. We know that seven being fullness, completion, represents the entire church. So the message is to the priestly and to the kingly offices. It's time to be a royal priesthood, priests and kings. That's the imagery we're seeing here. I don't believe it's just two individuals. I, you know, I tend to believe there's going to be those that operate, you know, in the heart of David. They're going to operate in the Davidic anointing. They're going to operate in the worship, and they're going to be called to that ministry, more of the priesthood, the ministry of worship, the word, and all that comes with it. And then you're going to have at the same time, like the kingly, the, the governor, the one that's going to put it in place. It could be government. It could be politics. But I believe it's not just one person. Some people are like, maybe this is the messianic and the Gentile believers grafted in, a group of those that are messianic, spirit-filled Jews, and, and maybe an aspect of the Gentile grafted it and they're manifesting uh, the, the offices of the priest and the king and they're functioning. You know, why would God in the end have everything be about the body of Christ? Everybody goes into all the world. The mandate was for everybody. Why would God in the end just go, well, I'm done with everybody. Let's just use 144,000 or, hey, I'm done with using everybody. Let's go back to just using two people. No, it's like a prophetic picture. We saw Moses and Elijah joined with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The ministry to do the miracles Elijah did, the ministry to do the miracles that Moses did, is the key to the ministry of the Bana Shetzar, the sons of fresh oil, endued and supplied with oil. And to be this, the whole key is, are you standing? Are you positioned by the Lord? Are you just going to be those branches that are plugged into the vine, receiving the golden oil? And then, you know, the branches bear fruit, ministry fruit, healing, salvation, whatever it is that you do for the Lord, the branches drip the oil, fruit happens. But this is the ministry I believe we're going to see emerge right now. We're going to start seeing the two witnesses. And I don't believe there are two individuals, but movements or groups or, or whatever. I don't have to have it all figured out. And you don't either. Just be ready to receive the fresh oil, ready to receive the anointing. So coming back to a couple more things I want to give you with the theme of my message here today about keeping your oil and more than that, overflow and taking an extra vessel full of oil. I'd like to, uh, for your own study, you can go back and look at the story of both Elisha and Elijah because they had the supernatural supply of extra oil. And it started out with just a little, you know, a jar of oil, it started out with a bin of flour. And both through the ministry of Elisha and Elijah, God decided to multiply their oil, didn't he? But there was a few things that happened, especially in the story in 2 Kings 4. I believe it's 2 Kings 4 verse 1. You can read in those first seven verses, 2 Kings, where it talks about uh, the oil and the widow. I'm just going to make a, a, a meal here. Or, or she says to the prophet, uh, you know, that's Elijah. Elisha says, hey, the creditors are coming. The creditors are coming. They're coming to take my sons. There's a great debt and they're taking my sons as a slave. Think of a foreclosure on your house or financial messes and anybody that doesn't like to have debt and you kind of feel like you're a slave. And we know the message of Jesus' jubilee. And uh, this widow was one of the, the sons of the prophets, you know. And so she was like, hey, my, my, my husband's gone. I'm a widow. Uh, the creditors are coming. I have no money. Nobody could take care of me anymore in the ministry. There's no supply. Uh, I, I got this last little jar of oil, and that's it. And the prophet comes, and he says, I got the word of the Lord. You remember the story, right? And the prophet says, uh, go to your neighbor's. That was the key to the extra oil in the story with Elisha was go to your neighbors. 
Get out of your house. Get out of your wherever it is that you are. Get out into the world. Go into all the world. Go out to your neighbor's house and gather up empty vessels. We know the story, but did you know this part? Don't just gather a few. This is key, people, to prosperity. Do not just gather a few. So you got to command. You need something to put the oil in. You need vessels to put the oil in. So when you go to your neighbors to get the empty vessels, yeah, we could talk about evangelism, outreach. That's not the whole take of my message today. What I want to take under the story in 2 Kings 4, verse 1 through 7 today is the idea on how to get the extra oil. And so we see the supernatural multiplication of oil through the story of Elisha and Elijah. I'm focusing on the creditors are coming. I don't have any supply. I don't have enough oil. And the prophet says, go to your neighbors and gather empty vessels. Don't just gather a few. Why? Because you are the one at times where you set in your mindset, in your expectation, your faith, how much we're going to receive. So if you gathered up 20 vessels, you would have 20 vessels full of oil in that story. But what if you didn't just gather a few and you gathered 30 vessels? What if you gathered 50 vessels? What if you gathered 100 vessels? Why would the Lord say to the prophet, do not just gather a few if God didn't want to bless you big time and overflow? So the only limitations on how much we receive sometimes is you and me and our ability to do what the word of the Lord says. And in this story, the prophet Elisha is saying, go to your neighbors and get these empty vessels because you're going to need them for that little jar of oil. How are you going to take that little bit of oil and turn it into an extra uh, supply, overflowed, multiplied oil? Well, when you take that oil or the vessels into your house and you shut the door, you pour out that oil into the empty vessels. And as long as it was an empty vessel to pour into, the oil did not run dry. That means the lamp kept burning and they always had an extra supply of oil overflow so that when you said, my lamp's not burning, like the foolish virgins, hey, give us some of the oil you have because our lamps are about to go out. Well, you needed to take an extra vessel of oil. Well, here's the key to the extra vessel of oil is to be sure he who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed. The law of the spirit that if you're refreshing others and you're being a vessel that brings healing and hope and life and promise and the glory to others he who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed but you must also understand there is a practical point to the story about receiving the extra multiplied oil in this story is to be sure are you going to your neighbors are you going to the ones that are empty and need to be filled up with the good word of God they need to be filled up with the hope that you bring and the life that you bring I just had the chance with my wife right here in my own home to pray for two uh, of the ladies that have been coming into our house the house keepers and uh, we had two of them coming in into our house and they've been you know beautiful people in our home and we give them gifts and they bring us gifts but this was the first time we opened up and said hey you were in a car accident the two of them in our home and my wife and I just it just happened a few days ago right here in our house we're able to pray for them and they had a, such an encounter with the Holy Spirit one was crying and she was shaking and she got a healing in her neck and the and visibly was sh uh, shocked by the uh, power of the Holy Spirit coming on her and, and we were able just to pour out those uh, vessels and I find that for me when I'm moving in revival ministry, as long as I'm in the momentum of revival day in and day out even, I, I operate better than go, go, stop. Take a week or two off. Go, go, go three days. Take a weekend off. Go, go, go. Stop. I, I, I function much better in night after night. Salvation, healing, deliverance, miracles. Because when I'm in the momentum and after I'm done the mission or the mandate or the revival or whatever it is I'm doing, conference, then it's time to sit back and be sure I'm as focused on those alone times or rest times doing what I would do in the busy times of revival or events or preaching or conferences or crusades that when I'm not doing those things that I'm still in prayer every day and I'm in the word every day. Day and I'm praying in tongues every day and I'm doing the practical things that can help me stay full of the oil as well. Hallelujah. Because you don't want to stop. Somebody said it. Good quote. You do not want to stop the flow. And you can see the story again with Elijah and, and, and his story was very similar, but it was the small bin of flour that did not run dry. And you look at what the Elijah the prophet had the widow and her son do first before they ate their last meal and died. The prophet Elijah was like, give me something to eat first. Be sure to take care of me and, and I'll be sure to make sure there's a supply in your life. I believe that's a principle too. God may lead you 
to, to give, to tithe to a particular church or ministry, uh, partner with a particular ministry. It could be a man of God, could be a woman of God. Uh, different seasons, you're, you're led to have different seeds or different partnership or different types of giving or partnership. But, you know, that's what Elijah said. Hey, partner with me. If you'll make me a cake first and be sure to remember that if you honor the prophet in the name of the prophet and take care of the ministry and the word that I'm bringing to you, then you'll have no lack. Your bin of flour will not run dry. That's what Elijah said. Your bin of flour will not run dry. I can speak and prophesy to your wallet, to your business, to your finances, to your bank account. And I do. I say in the name of Jesus, your, your supplies shall not run dry. That little bin of flour should have made one last meal. And the widow was going to eat it. Her son was going to eat it. They were going to die. Elijah said, make it for me first. Give it to the prophet first. Serve the word of the Lord coming to you first. And, and give something of value that you have in your house. And, and all that you have left is this one little jar of oil. And you're afraid you're going to die will give it to me first doesn't make sense it's contrary to everything that we think about why wouldn't you be bringing groceries to the poor and the prophet shows up and goes i got something better than just bringing you groceries or giving you a check i'm going to give you a word that will cause your bin of flour to not run dry and that's where i believe spirit-led sowing spirit-led giving Again, I always have an opportunity for people to sow and plant seed. If you've got a revelation about seed time and harvest and giving and you want to honor the Lord today and sow into today's message even, uh, and you're giving maybe your tithe and your offering anyways, pray over it when you give today on Secret Place Church, when you give today on our website. Uh, maybe you're giving today and you're using PayPal. Or find a way to sow a seed and, and let me prophesy that your bin of flowers shall not run dry. And see, that's another way we tap into the multiplied oil, you know, that there can be men and women of God or, or ministries God calls you alongside of and, you, and you're, you're giving them life, you're giving them ministry and in return, you're going to eat that meal and their whole house is going to eat that meal and they're not going to run out of supply, they're not going to run out of flour, they're not going to run out of money uh, because she chose to obey and hear and receive the ministry of the word of God first. And that's another principle in receiving the extra oil. Consider that in your giving today. And I am going to ask you to give today on revivalharvestministries.org. I'd ask you to go to our website and sow a first fruit seed, uh, launch us back out. This is more than a comeback uh, and be a part of the new thing that's happening. Plant a seed. It could be $10. It could be 100 Whatever the Lord says. If you want to give on PayPal, you can. Uh, we have a PayPal as well, but all the links are, are going to be in the giving section. Go to our website, revivalharvestministries.org. Yes, you can give on freshfireusa.com and many of your partners on how to give anyways, but thank you for your spirit-led giving today after the broadcast and I do have a PayPal if you want to give. I don't receive a money or I don't receive an honorarium for doing these messages. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, if you want to sow a seed, you can. PayPal.me is my PayPal. Uh, PayPal.me forward slash Todd Bentley. Thank you. I'll pray over every gift, over every seed. Uh, but let's continue here. Uh, I want to pray over you guys. I want to pray over you guys here. I want to pray for the fresh oil today. I hope you go back and, and there's a lot of stuff I dropped in this message and hear it again. I'll upload it to our Supernatural Living messages on iTunes. You can sign up for free on iTunes and be sure to get my weekly podcast, Supernatural Living Messages. Thousands are getting that podcast every week and they're hearing this message. And many are hearing this message today on Secret Place. It will be on YouTube. It'll be uploaded into our media center within 24 hours. But uh, Father, I thank you today for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for those uh, that are praying for for the oil, for the fresh oil, that, Lord, there would be a supply of oil that would not run dry. Just like the bin of flour and Elijah prophesied, uh, you know, because she chose to honor the ministry of the prophetic word and uh, her bin of flour did not run dry. Just like as long as there were empty vessels to pour into, the oil did not stop flowing. I thank you, God, right now that more than just a fresh anointing, Lord, pour out the overflow. I'm going to prophesy and decree that you, your church, your ministry, your, your business this year is coming into the overflow, coming into the overflow. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Mary Ann, we love you guys. Uh, please say hi. Let me know where you're coming in from. If you're just joining the broadcast, I want to comment with some of you for the next few minutes. But Lord, release that fresh anointing, the oil, the light, the revelation, the fresh fire of the Holy Ghost. Let those lamps burn bright. And that those extra vessels of oil be filled up. Lord, show me how to get. And listen, be open to this. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and show you 
in your own unique way, like he showed Elisha and Elijah to go to those widows. Ask the Lord specifically in this season, Lord, what's the key to growing in, not stopping the flow, the overflow for me, my call, how about my business? Uh, the Lord can show you a unique strategy, just like he did for Elisha and Elijah. The Lord has unique strategies for you that might not seem to make sense to anybody, but the Lord's speaking to you. And that could be about how you sow or how you give or how you plant. It could be right down to the Lord sends you out. Get out of your land, get out of your country and, and you know, start the journey. And, 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 and in the end, it'll unfold the progressive unfolding nature of Revelation. As you take those first steps like Abraham, uh, I'll open it up for you. So be open to hearing the unique word of the Lord today or even uh, as you seek him and go, God, what's the key for me to be like the wise virgins? I don't want to be like the fool virgins. And uh, God, I want to be a, a part of the, the two witnesses. I want to be a part of that kind of ministry where you trust me with power. Listen to that again, Revelation 11 verse 6, as often as they desire. And what was the key to God releasing the power in Revelation 11 verse 3 and 4? Power to prophesy, prophetic power. God measured three things in Revelation 11 verse 1. He measured their prayer life, he measured their worship life, and he measured their church life. And when the church life was to the point, when the worship was to the point of passion, when the, everything was at the right measurement, the Lord released power. And the, the beginning of the ministry of the sons of fresh oil, as we read about in Zechariah 4, Revelation 11, started to happen. And there was trust where God was using groups of people to do ministry and signs like Elisha and Elijah, just like he calling you and me. And to be a part of the last day church to do the kinds of signs that Elijah and Eli Moses did, not just physical healings and miracles and words of knowledge. But we're going to move into the days of signs in the heavens above, wonders in the earth beneath, and the anointing of the sons uh, of fresh oil. So go back and listen to this whole message, tag somebody, share it with a group of intercessors or prophetic people. I want to say God bless you and remember all the updates, how to give, how to partner, how to get information about RHA Charlotte coming up in Charlotte, March 18th to the 21st, register, volunteer, all of that and everything I talked about can be found on our website. You can still visit freshfireusa.com, but our new ministry website and new ministry, revivalharvestministries.org. So would you give today? And if you have a tithe today, and I'm praying that if you're blessed by today's message, you should all be sowing a seed, letting me know that you appreciate what we're bringing to you uh, and uh, honor the Lord with a first fruit seed. You can do that secure on our website after the broadcast. You can go to revivalharvestministries.org and plant a seed. Or if you want to be a blessing personally to me, to my wife, Jessa, and you want to honor the prophet in the name of the prophet and sow a seed, uh, my PayPal is uh, paypal.me forward slash Todd Bentley. I, do, I am set up with a cash app as well. Just uh, I'm Todd Bentley on Cash App. You can find me there. And uh, we appreciate that. And those of you that partner and sew into what we're doing around the world, we're getting ready for a, a busier uh, 2021. And I will be taking ministry engagements. I am planning a few ministry events right now. Uh, but uh, thank you for your prayers and, and your partnership. Let me know who's on. And uh, uh, if you have a comment or a question, let me just spend a few minutes uh, here connecting with you guys. You want to come to Charlotte? It's your birthday, Shelly. We welcome you. Come and be a part of our teams here. Are you volunteered yet? Have you connected with Joshua Patat? He's going to be our outreach director. But we are having uh, people volunteer now and sign up now for free to be a part of our ministry teams, healing teams, worship teams, evangelism teams, outreach, feeding the homeless teams. Uh, we're doing it here in Charlotte, March 18th to the 21st. And you want to get signed up on our website now, revivalharvestministries.org. There should be a volunteer form. You're coming from the Big Island, Hawaii. Oh, man, I need a trip to Hawaii again. I don't know how it's going there with all the corona and the pandemic, but God bless the Big Islands. Love the love Hawaii. I'm here for just a few minutes. If you want to ask a question, a comment, or a question, or anything in response to today's teaching, Joshua is amazing. Pastor's heart. We're glad to have Joshua with us on our team. We're going to be ordaining him. An associate. I've got some great people with us. I'm glad you all follow and know uh, Joshua. He'll be helping us uh, manage all the outreach teams for the RHA Charlotte event. We're believing God to shake our city with the glory. A fresh release of the Billy Graham mantle here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mark, uh, do you remember me from our lunch in Abbotsford years ago? Mark, I don't. I had probably 500 lunches with people in Abbotsford. I'm sorry, Mark. 
but my kids still live in Abbotsford, precious. I haven't been up there in a long time, but God bless you, Mark. Thanks for watching today. You can catch me here, uh, you know, Sundays at 11 a.m. on the Secret Place Church Group. If I'm not preaching, we have a guest. I'm so glad that you're doing that. Come and receive the fire here, and, and uh, we're going to have hundreds doing it here, uh, outreach uh, for the RHA Charlotte event. We'd love to have you come down and serve and be a part of that there, uh, Stefan. Uh, and maybe you'll get an impartation, take it back, and we can maybe lend some strength to what you're doing in the streets of your city. We're going to be doing this, uh, you know, this year we're planning events in um, uh, New Jersey. I'm, I'm working on events in Mississippi, Ohio, uh, upstate New York, Rochester. Uh, these are kind of places that are hungry for the harvest, for evangelism, for training, for all that, that comes with it. So Joshua Patat is commenting now. If you want to reach out to him and you're not following Joshua Patat, you need to. And he manages some of our RHA ministry groups on Facebook and the RHA prayer, uh, Tuesday Night Prayer Shield. We do a, a prayer revival every week if you want to jump in on the prayer shield. So get plugged in, guys. It's coming up quick. March 18th here. we got six weeks to go. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about RHA Charlotte and how to be a part of the teams and volunteer and, and, and serve. And we could really could use all the help and money. And the reason to give right now is to so into the outreach and so into the harvest 100% evangelism and if we had everybody watching you know do the best they can if you could sow $50 or $100 or into the harvest into revival harvest to uh, America into what we're going to be doing on our streets that would be awesome you know thank you partners we could use that healing uh, pray for Eric guys we rebuke uh, the black mold symptoms I rebuke black mold symptoms now, and I command healing to flow in Jesus' name. Any last-minute comments or questions? St. Catherine's Church. Oh, yeah, bless you. Shalom. Thank you for speaking. Shalom, peace, prosperity. Yeah, pray for Revival Harvest America, guys. Pray now. Receptivity, the streets, the workers, the laborers, the venue, the lockdowns, the restrictions, but we're going to be out there and be a witness. I'm praying we'll be the sons of fresh all the two witnesses. And we don't want to just do RHA Charlotte. I'm open to other RHA type events, even if they're training, mobilizing uh, in 2021 and you're ready for a big crusade in 2022. Reach out to our ministry through our website, revivalharvestministries.org. We are taking prayer requests on our website anytime, day and night. You can send in your prayer needs on revivalharvestministries.org. All right, guys, any last minute, you know, thank you for those that have been sowing weekly and, and graciously and, and, and partnering. And if you've been a partner and you want to renew your partnership, this is the year. Thank you. You can renew your partnership, update all your details on our website. Again, my PayPal personally, and I want to be thankful. I wouldn't have been able to make it this far without our partners that have, have stood with me and my wife, Jessa, and our family personally, as we've been in a time of recovering and healing and faith and like many of you, it's been a challenging time, but we've risen above. Hallelujah. And I wouldn't have traded the last 18 months to be in the secret place for anything. But if you want to give in a personal way, I always just mention, you know, I don't take an honorarium or get anything for preaching. Uh, PayPal.me forward slash Todd Bentley. My cash app is just I am my name, Todd Bentley. And uh, we do have Venmo and other ways to give. That's personal giving. Our website is the best way to give and partner and online, secure, get a tax receipt, revivalharvestministries.org. So thank you for sowing. Mark is asking, what is the largest one-time donation I have ever received? Uh, I don't know. 60000 you know, kind of like that. It's been more collective, not one time. I don't have any one-time big donors or one-time big anybody financing us. So I don't know that uh, the biggest donation I can think of. Uh, well, actually, I received with God TV. I was leading a revival in South Africa, Healing Awakening South Africa. Weeks and weeks and weeks of revival. And it was on television, South Africa. This was uh, 2013. I was given a brand new 911 Porsche in the offering. Brand new 911 Porsche in the offering. And I got to drive it around the city a little bit. And I didn't know what I was going to do with this brand new Porsche. $85,000. We liquefied the Porsche. I got $85,000. And I took that money personally in our ministry. And we gave it 100% into Revival and God TV. $85,000. So that would probably be the biggest one-time donation. A million-dollar check this month. Pray for that. And I'll tell you, if you're praying for a million-dollar check, sow towards it. 
I'm praying for a million dollar provision. It's like the poor, I'm hungry. Praying for you, brother. Well, well, you know, pray for the poor, but give them 10 bucks and then pray for them to get a million. Always sow into what you're praying and decreeing people, especially if it's money. I've never had a guest minister come to my church and tell me, hey, I need a breakthrough. Pray for me uh, without taking an offering. I'm going to pray for your ministry. No, I'm going to take an offering. I'm going to pray for you, brother, financially. Thank you. I do want all the prayers. No, I'm not saying don't pray, but but so give. If you're not tithing, you got a church you're tithing to, and, and maybe you're not plugged in anywhere and this is your church online, tithe. We could use your help. It's collectively together as a body, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 people giving as they can throughout the month, You know, not just Sunday, but uh, we, we've understand that, that there's power. I've had so many testimonies over the year of supernatural breakthrough in my life and my call and my ministry uh, with money I didn't have. I've never had any money to start out doing what God's called me to do, a crusade in Africa, a crusade in Pakistan, a crusade in India, uh, Lake in Florida when we had the big revival with Florida. I didn't have any money to rent those venues and stadiums and tents and RHA renting the Angeles uh, Temple in Los Angeles for RHA uh, LA back in 2019. I didn't have the money for any of these things. God calls me. I've got 10 bucks in the bank. And then in the end, we, we do million dollar vision and million dollar mandate. So uh, we're calling it in. I'm praying for you. that There's going to be a supernatural year uh, for the little guys, not just the elites. Thank you, Adam. Any last minute questions why I'm hanging out before I end the broadcast? I've got a supernatural mentoring I'm doing today with a pastor from um, uh, Australia. And people, you didn't know this maybe, but you could schedule personal one-on-one -on -one mentoring and personal one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with me. And we'll talk about money, partners, fundraising, ministry, revival, the supernatural, angels, whatever you want me to mentor you in. Uh, and you could set up an hour, and I do have a few spots open if you're interested in getting an hour with me uh, for one of my personal mentoring or coaching sessions. And uh, I don't advertise it a whole lot because I'm busy, but uh, I've got a, and the, the broadcast here this morning, get ready. You know, the time zone is different in Australia. And uh, I have a couple of people uh, from uh, like Australia, New Zealand, England, uh, you know, America, and they just get up with me on the phone, sometimes once a month or once a week or bi-weekly. And, you know, I pour into them and I mentor them one on one and uh, we don't have a set cost but you can do it it's a donation based uh, and you can reach out to me personally this is not through the ministry this is personally uh, and I can coach you in any area that you want a group of leaders if you want and I know a few things about setting up your ministry and setting up your business and how it all kind of works to behind the scenes and I can give away all those goodies uh, and help coach and mentor you spiritually practically you can reach out to me uh, on, on my uh, if you know me by you know Facebook or email, of course, you can DM me. Uh, you can reach out by text for those that are really in the know, or uh, send a message. You know through our website revivalharvestministries.org. Uh, this is not our mentoring for partners program we have. That's the classes we do. I'm doing a new one with Michael Fick is coming up in March. Uh, that'll be free for partners. But I am uh, putting together one-on-one -on -one coaching. And some people have wanted to pick my brain about supernatural or revival or angels or how to build structures and raise money and do their 501c3 and how to get those 3,000 monthly giving partners and, you know, how you've been able to do that over 24 years, Todd. I've been able to sustain my life and ministry through good times, through hard times, and here we still are. And I would like to share that wisdom with many of you that would like to uh, have me mentoring or coaching. You want to set up a time, we can do it by Zoom or Facebook Live and just kind of you and me. So uh, if you're in the loop, reach out. Hi, Kim. Good to see you. Thank you for being a friend and partner with us these months. We appreciate you, Kim. <clears throat> Anybody else on the broadcast want to say hi real quick? Blessings and favor, traveling mercies on that trip to California. Again, our, our giving for those that are wanting to bring their tithe here. This is our Secret Place Church online. If you enjoyed today's message, you want to sow into it. Please take a moment and visit revivalharvestministries.org, plant a seed, or find a way to give personally. My PayPal, uh, paypal.me forward slash Todd Bentley, or Cash App, I'm Todd Bentley. Thank you guys for your support. We need it, especially with the RHA upcoming event and the ministry relaunch happening here. It's a new vision. Thank you guys. Oh, the email. I, I think it's Todd Bentley, uh, Todd Bentley Mentoring at gmail.com. I actually have a mentoring email. If you want to email me, put that up. Todd Bentley Mentoring at gmail.com. T-O-D-D-B-N-T-L-E-Y. 
Todd Bentley mentoring at gmail.com. Oh, there's my buddy Charles. Thank you, Charles, man. You've been a blessing. God's plugged you into what we're doing. I don't know if you're going to come down for the uh, RHA Charlotte event there, uh, Charles, but we just appreciate you. and Thank you for all the, the times the Lord has led you to give and so couldn't have done it without you, brother. So yeah, if you want to set up that one hour of, of, of counseling with me or set up something bi-weekly or monthly or for a series of time and you'd like me to mentor you and coach you personally one-on-one, uh, email me. Todd Bentley mentoring at gmail.com. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Again, giving revivalharvestministries.org. So in the RHA Charlotte, we need those thousand dollar gifts. If you want to sow a personal seed, you're blessed by today's message and you want to uh, say thank you, Todd. PayPal.me forward slash Todd Bentley or Cash App. But we're, we're really praying that you all respond to my new letter that me and Jessa just put out on our website from the desk of Todd Bentley. It should be an updated letter on our website for sure by Monday. And our, our podcast, are you following our weekly podcast? Thousands of us are, are joining us on iTunes, Supernatural Living Messages. And look for us on, uh, you know, YouTube. God bless you guys. Thanks, Joshua Patat. I hope you reach out to him about the outreach. He's got all the details. God bless you guys and be filled with fresh fire. Share the broadcast uh, from today. Spread it around your network and pages and let people by, be blessed by today's message on keeping your oil. Thank you for joining me. Bam. See you next week, 11 a.m. Bam.